Good morning. Merry Christmas to everybody. Uh, I'm going to start by sharing a little bit of an embarrassing story. I was raised in a Christian home. My dad was a pastor since I was a little boy, and so we went to church all the time. And uh, in college at HBU, uh, I made the basketball team, and we were going to travel to play another college. So we were going to travel all these miles so that I could go sit on the bench there in their gym, which was really awesome. A really <laughs> great experience all through and through. But uh, when the schedule was released, we were going to play against the University of the Incarnate Word, and I had no idea what that even meant. Incarnate Word. And so when, when the schedule was released, I was taking my New Testament survey class, and one of my textbooks was called Dictionary of Jesus and the Gospels. And so I thought, what does incarnate word mean? So how many of you have ever heard that word? Just raise your hand. How many of you actually know what it means? Okay, I'm, I'm impressed that you guys know. You were smarter than me as a freshman, for sure. So I looked it up in the Dictionary of Jesus and the Gospels. I could not find the word incarnate anywhere in that dictionary. And so I had to do a little bit more digging now to age myself a little bit. I was not able to Google it because Google didn't even exist at that time. Isn't it amazing? And so I had to walk about five miles uphill barefoot in the snow to a place <laughs> called the library. Y'all know what that place is? And you had to go in and they had a Dewey decimal system. I don't know who Dewey is, but he had a decimal system. And you had to go in and I checked out all these books, dictionaries and those kind of things. I like that. I like you like my joke. I love it. Uh, and so... I, I look it up, and, and I, I looked up the word incarnate, and I found out what it meant. And so here I'm a freshman in college, have been raised in church all my life, and I discovered what this word meant. And it was something that I believed in and had believed for a long time, but I just didn't know that this was the word used to describe it. The word incarnate means embodied in flesh or given a body, especially a human form. So the word incarnate simply means that something is given a body, a human body. And the incarnate word, that university, was based on John chapter 1, the name of it, when the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. The word was given bodily form, and so they called it the incarnate word. That blew your mind, didn't it? I mean, it blew my mind. And so I thought, well, we're going to go here and play this college and so I want to be the first one today to not only wish you Merry Christmas, but I want to wish you a Merry Incarnation Day. And in fact, when you go to all your family get-togethers over the next couple of days, just say, Merry Incarnation. It's, it's going to just flow off your lips. And I think Christmas is the better word because the songs that we sing, just they don't, make, they don't work with incarnation. There's too many syllables. We wish you a Merry Incarnation. See, it, it doesn't flow, right? Or, or maybe, have yourself. A merry little incarnation. It, it's not the same as Christmas, is it? Or Elvis? Well, I'm a having a blue. And you miss your cue. That's where you go, woo, right? <laughs> having a blue incarnation. See, it's not. It doesn't work, right? So we say Christmas, but Christmas is a celebration of the incarnation. It's a celebration of when God came in human bodily form to the earth. Now, we've been doing a series here at the Brook called Christmas Trees, and it might not be the kind of trees that you would think. We've been focusing on the genealogy of Jesus from Matthew 1, verses 1 through 17, and then following those verses as well. And we've been studying that family tree, and you're going to see a little bit more of that this morning. But in that series, I, I made a point in the first message that I want to share with you again, and that is that a broken family tree can become a story of redemption. That when we look in the genealogy of Jesus, there are some pretty shady characters in his family tree. I was asked on Friday night, true story by someone here, hey, do you know so-and-so, are you related to blank Pollard? I don't remember the first name. And my answer to that was, well, it depends on the story you're about to share, right? Because I have a lot of Pollards. My dad had 11 siblings, uh, 10 siblings, so we have a ton of Pollards spread up through East Texas, but we don't claim all of them. You know what I'm saying? You got that in your... In Jesus' family tree is very much the same thing, but we saw in that brokenness how God used the brokenness of that family tree to bring about a story of redemption in the birth of Jesus. Now, the birth of Jesus that we studied, the, the narrative we studied last week was in Matthew chapter 1, uh, verses 18 and following, but I want to focus for a moment on Matthew 1, 23. It'll be on the screen here, and then we're going to go to Luke chapter 2. 
Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. That three-word phrase in the English language is a perfect description of the incarnation. That the incarnation, when God took human form in the form of Jesus, it was God coming to the earth to be with us. He was born like we were born. He lived the life that we live as humans, except he did it in perfection. And then he died, of course, on the cross for our sins. But Jesus is God with us. And so at Christmas... We are celebrating what's called the Incarnation. If you have your Bible, I want us to study today in Luke chapter 2. So open your Bible there, your Bible app. And I want you to follow along as as we read this morning. Of all the Christmas passages, Luke chapter 2 is head and shoulders above the rest for me. It's my favorite. I have preached this passage so many times through the years. It's such a beautiful passage, and I'm so excited to be able to share with you today this passage. And what I hope to share are five Christmas blessings that we learn from this story. And at the end of that, of this message, after I share those five with you, I want to share with you how you can have those blessings in your life. So Luke chapter 2 and verse 1, in those days, in those days, excuse me, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was first, uh, this was the first registration when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town, And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. And here's the family tree here. Because he was of the house and lineage of David. To be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. Now, if you've been to a Christmas service before, or you've been around church for any length of time, or you've heard a pastor or a teacher ever talk to you about the Christmas story, you're pretty familiar with what I just described. That Joseph and Mary made the trip. Most of us see that that would be on a donkey ride, and and they drive, they go from drive, they go from Nazareth (laughs) down to Jerusalem, uh, down to Bethlehem. Excuse me. And while they're there, she gives birth to the son Jesus, wraps him in the uh, strips of cloth. And then places him in the manger. And we see the nativity scenes uh, at Christmas time. And it's easy for us to skim through those verses because we've heard it before and miss out on the miraculous. But in those first seven verses, there are actually three miracles that have taken place. And I want to show you what those miracles are. Jeremiah had prophesied hundreds of years before the birth of Jesus. He said this in Jeremiah 23 and verse 5. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord. When I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely, and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. Hundreds of years before the birth of Jesus, Jeremiah prophesied that when the Savior would come, he would come from the lineage or the line of David. Now Isaiah, writing long time before the the birth of Jesus, wrote in Isaiah chapter 7 another prophecy. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they, and, the, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. And I quoted that verse earlier from Matthew chapter 1 when Jesus was born. And then Micah prophesied that when the Messiah would come, in Micah chapter 5 and verse 2, that Messiah would come through Bethlehem. But notice at the end of that prophecy, he says, For from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from old, from ancient days. So when Micah penned that, that this, that Bethlehem would produce the Messiah. Notice at the end of that prophecy, it says that his going forth or his comings have been from old or from ancient days, from everlasting. In other words, when that Savior would be born, he would be God incarnate. It would be God in the flesh. He was eternal. The Word in the beginning that was with God would become flesh and dwell among us. Now I want you to think about just how miraculous this moment is. In verse 4 of Luke 2, we see that Joseph is the earthly father of Jesus. And Joseph was from the house and the lineage of David. That's a direct fulfillment of Jeremiah's prophecy in Jeremiah 23. When they're in Bethlehem, Mary, who is a virgin, we learn from not only Luke's gospel, but in Matthew chapter 1 as well, that Mary is a virgin. And she gives birth to a son, which is a direct fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy in Isaiah chapter 7. In verse 14. But look at verse 6. 
Now, when we think of Jesus, sometimes you might hear people say, it's Jesus of what? Nazareth. And that's because Joseph lived in Nazareth. But where was Jesus born? He was born in Bethlehem. And being born in Bethlehem was necessary to fulfill the prophecy of Micah chapter 5. But I want you to think about the miraculousness of this moment. That Joseph and Mary who live in Nazareth have their son Jesus in Bethlehem. And it's not because God supernaturally moved them from one place to the other. And we see in scripture he had done that before. Philip who's ministering in Gaza is all of a sudden gone and he's in another place. But in this case God moved through the Roman government through a census, a registration to be taken. And because the Roman de uh, governor decreed that this had to happen, Joseph took his pregnant wife on a very long trip from Nazareth down to Bethlehem. And it just so happens at just the right time while they were there, she gave birth to Jesus. And that's a miracle. And that miracle then sets the stage for an announcement from God about what has just transpired. Look at verse 8 of Luke chapter 2. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. Now, don't look down on the shepherds here, because if, a, if an angel appeared in your room tonight and you knew that angel was real, would you feel really great about what God was about to say to you? I would hope so, but there may be like, oh, you saw that, huh? But I love what God has done here. He appears not to a king, not to a governor, not to nobility. God chooses to announce the birth of his son to common people. Just guys at work tending their flock, their shepherds. And when I read this story and the, and the choice that God made to announce the birth of his son to shepherds, it reminds me of what Jesus said in John chapter 10. He said, I am the good shepherd. And the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. Now in verse 10, the message of the angel is declared. And as we read these verses, there are five blessings that come from this message about Christmas. I want you to listen for them as we read it. Verse 10, and the angel said to them, fear not. For behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. Five blessings from the Christmas uh, message. The first one, I want you to write this down, is calm. The first word that was spoken by the angel to the shepherds was fear not. Do not be afraid. Now the shepherds when the angel appeared were, were fearful. That's what verse 9 tells us. Because he, they didn't know exactly what kind of greeting this would be. Remember when the angel appeared to Mary and was going to tell her that you're going to have a child and, and that child is going to be the son of God. That Mary was fearful because she didn't know exactly why this angel was here. Was this an announcement of judgment or was it an announcement of blessing? And it ended up, of course, being an announcement of blessing. But as these shepherds are kind of quaking in fear, the first word to them is, do not be afraid. Calm replaces fear. The second blessing is in verse 10 when they said, I bring you good news. Anyone ever asked you, all right, look, I've got good news and bad news. Which one would you like first? So let's take a poll of the room. How many of you like the bad news first? Just raise your hand. How many of you like the good news first? All right. And, and how many of you don't like news apparently because you didn't raise your hand? Okay, but we're all right with that. I'm a bad news guy first. Just lay it out there. Tell me where we are because then the conversation can end on the good news, right? I don't want the conversation to start really high and then be like, womp, womp, womp. You know, that nobody wants to end like that. It's like the wife who comes in and she tells her husband, uh, I've got good news and bad news. Which do you want first? And the husband said, well, I'll take the, I'll take the, the good news. And, and the wife said, well, the airbags on your brand new car worked perfectly. <laughs> in order to understand the good news of Christmas, we do have to understand the bad news. 
Now, when you talk to people about a relationship with God, I think this is true, that most people and probably every person in this room thinks you're a pretty good person. In your life, you probably think like most people that you've done more good things than bad. And so when you talk to people about their relationship with God, they'll say, well, I'm a good person. And for the most part, I think that's true. But in our minds, what, we're, what we mean by that is I haven't done anything really bad, you know? Like I haven't murdered someone. And we think that's one of the worst things you could do as a human is to murder someone. And so when we think of ourselves kind of as good people, I think that's what most of us think, that, well, I haven't done something really bad, and so that means I'm a good person. I want to share with you what Jesus said in Mark chapter 7. If you were reading in your, in your hard copy of the Bible, you'll notice that all of these words are in red because it's actually Jesus speaking. And he said this, What comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. Now, as I read that list, not a list that I came up with, but what Jesus said about us, did you find any of the sins in that list in your own heart? You ever struggled with pride? Have you ever struggled with envy? If you don't think that you have, then you have forgotten what it's like to be a kid at Christmas time. Because the reason you make up that list is because you want something that you have seen someone else have. Or that an, an advertisement makes you think that everyone has it. So we've all struggled. We have all sinned. And even though we might think, well, I'm a pretty good person. I haven't done something really bad. Here's what God says to us. There is no one righteous, no, not one. That we have all sinned and we fall short of the glory of God. That's the bad news. But did you hear in verse 10 that the angels declared that I'm bringing to you good news? And here's the good news of the Christmas message. That even though you are a sinner, your sins can be forgiven. Your sins can be forgiven because of what happened at Christmas. I want you to think about this for a moment. Why was Jesus born into the world? Was it because in eternity past that somehow God was lacking something because he didn't have a human experience? No. It wasn't like God who was eternally existing in the past said, you know what? What I have right now is not enough. I need something more. God has the fullness of everything in himself. He doesn't lack anything. But when God formed the world and man sinned, God made a way for us to be right with him. And that way was through a Savior giving his life on the cross for your sins. So why did Christmas happen? Listen to what Jesus said from his own lips in Luke 19. For the Son of Man, speaking of himself, came to seek and to save the lost. In other words, Christmas happened because God is pursuing you. He came to seek you and to save you. And because of that, the angel said in verse 10, this is good news of great joy. Not little joy, not small joy, but great joy. I shared this last year. I want to share it again. When I think of great joy, the word in the Greek is megas, and it means great or large. And I think of it illustratively like this, a Lego piece. You've ever done Legos, right? It's small little bricks, and you can build really cool things. But then for little kids, they make the mega blocks. You know what I'm talking about? They're the bigger blocks, look like Legos, but it's easier for kids to manipulate the Lego is joy. The mega block is great joy. And this good news that God brought is not small joy. It's good news of great joy. And that great joy is the third blessing of Christmas. Because great joy can replace despair. It can replace the bad news that you're a sinner, hopelessly lost without a Savior. But the Christmas message is good news of great joy. And the fourth blessing is found in verse 11. And in verse 11, the angels declared, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. That blessing of Christmas is our salvation. Think about that one verse for a moment. Of all the words God could have used to describe Jesus, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a king of kings and lord of lords. 
For unto you is born this day in the city of David a mighty God, the everlasting Father. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a wonderful counselor, the Prince of Peace. But what word did he use? Savior. A Savior has been born for you. And your salvation in Christ is a blessing of Christmas. You see, the manger set God's plan for our salvation in motion. And at Christmas time, we put up Christmas trees in our homes. And we look at the lights and we look at the evergreen tree, uh, symbolic of the everlasting God and all the, the imagery that comes from those Christmas trees to mark that one moment of the manger when Jesus was born and placed in that manger and he was born as the Savior of the world. But the manger only set that plan in motion. It ended on another tree. It ended on the cross. When that Savior who was born died in your place to offer salvation to all. And on that cross, on that tree, Jesus said these words, it is finished. All that God required to pay the price for your sins was paid for on the cross. And the cross of Christ is the Christmas tree that you need in your heart today. That we don't stay at the manger, but we understand the manger set God's plan for salvation in motion. When that Savior was born, it ended on a cross. And three days later, he rose again in victory over the grave. And because of that, look down to verse 14. The angel said, glory to God in the highest and on, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. The fifth blessing is peace. I was in the seventh grade, it's going to age me a little bit, when the first um, invasion of Iraq happened. And I was sitting in my, in my class, and the, we had something called Channel One. My first period class was social studies, and I was sitting in that class, and for the first five or ten minutes of the class, they would show just uh, basically a newscast for students on, on the TV. And I remember watching the images of the American forces going there and invading, and they were showing tanks firing their, their, uh, their, what do they call them, missiles, bullets, whatever. And then you had bombs exploding, right? And you had this assault that's happening. And I remember in seventh grade feeling very afraid about that because my dad had been drafted into the Vietnam War. And growing up, my dad didn't tell us a lot of stories about the Vietnam War, but the ones he did share from time to time, sometimes when he was preaching, he would share some of these. The stories that he shared with me were very frightening. He was actually in charge of a tank. I think he was a tank commander. I don't know if that's his official rank. But he was in charge of the unit that was over a tank. And they were out driving one day. And one of the stories was they were just out doing a patrol. And they were ambushed. And he was sitting on top of the tank. And he said, I could hear and feel the speed of the bullets as they were going by my head. And one bullet went right over my head and killed his gunner that was right behind him. Just killed him right there on the spot. And they were ambushed, they called for artillery strikes, and they were able to at least escape that, but a couple of the men on the tank died in that assault. And as a seventh grade student, as I'm watching this happen on the screen, I was filled with fear and anxiety. Because, you know, you don't understand an adult world fully at that age. And I was wondering, like, well, what happens if I get drafted in the war? What happens if this war is still going on and I graduate like my dad did, and after I graduate, I have to go off to war? I have to go fight in this battle? And I had this unsettled feeling about what would happen. Have you ever felt that way about your relationship with God? Do you have an unsettled feeling that you just, you don't know for sure that you're right with God? You don't know for sure that if you stood before God one day and when that time and day of judgment comes, you don't know for sure that you're going to heaven. I want to share with you the good news of great joy that a Savior has been born and that Savior can give you and your heart the peace that you need with God. But you won't find it through religion. You won't find it through a church service. You won't find it in singing or singing by candlelight at Christmas. You will only find it in that Savior that was born for you. Paul said it in this way in Romans 5 and verse 1. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through Jesus, the peace that you seek today with God can replace the conflict and that unsettled feeling that you have in your heart that you're not right with Him. 
And that peace comes when we in our hearts place our faith in what Christ has done for us on the cross. So five blessings of the Christmas story. Calm, good news, great joy, salvation, and peace. So here's the question. How do you receive those blessings? I'd like to answer that by sharing a story that I read many years ago. It's a little bit lengthy, so I ask you to just bear with me as I read it. But I think this story will tell you exactly how you can have all of those blessings that are found in that first Christmas announcement. Years ago, there was a very wealthy man who, with his devoted young son, shared a passion for art collecting. Together, they traveled around the world, adding only the finest art treasures to their collection. Priceless works by Picasso, Van Gogh, and Monet, and many others adorned the wall of their family estate. The widowed elder, elderly man looked on with great satisfaction as his only child became an experienced art collector. And the son's trained uh, eye and sharp business mind caused his father, father excuse me, to beam with pride as they dealt with art collectors from around the world. As winter approached, war engulfed their nation, and the young man left to serve his country. After only a few short weeks, his father received a telegram. His beloved son was missing in action. The art collector anxiously awaited more news, fearing that he would never see his son again. Within days, his fears were confirmed. The young man had died while rushing a fellow soldier to a medic. Distraught and lonely, the old man faced the upcoming Christmas season with anguish and great sadness. On Christmas morning, a knock on the door awakened the depressed old man. As he walked to the door, the masterpieces of art on the wall only reminded him that his son was never coming home. As he opened the door, he was greeted by a soldier with a large gift in his hand. He introduced himself to the man by saying, I was a friend of your son. And I was the one he was rescuing when he died. May I come in for a few moments? I have a gift I'd like to give to you. As the two began to talk, the soldier told of how the man's son had told everyone of his and his father's love of fine art. I'm an artist, the soldier said, and I want to give you this. As the old man unwrapped the gift, the paper gave way to reveal a portrait of the man's son. And though the world would never consider it a work of art or a masterpiece, the painting, painting featured the young man's face in striking detail. Overcome with emotion, the father thanked the soldier, promising him that he would hang it above his fireplace. A few hours later, the soldier left and the old man set about his task. True to his word, the painting went above the fireplace, pushing aside thousands of dollars of paintings. And then the man sat in his chair and spent that Christmas gazing at the gift that he had been given. During the days and weeks that followed, the man realized that even though his son was no longer with him, the boy's life would live on because of those he had touched. He would soon learn that his son had rescued dozens of wounded soldiers before a bullet stilled his caring heart. As the stories of his son's gallantry continued to reach him, fatherly pride and satisfaction began to ease the grief. The painting of his son soon became the man's most prized possession, far eclipsing his interest in the pieces for which museums around the world clamored. He told his neighbors that this was the best gift he had ever received. The following spring, the man became ill and passed away, and the art world was in anticipation. With his passing and his only living relative deceased, those paintings would be sold at an auction. According to the will of the old man, all of the artworks would be auctioned on Christmas Day, the day that he had received his greatest gift. The day soon arrived and art collectors from around the world gathered to the estate to bid on some of the world's most spectacular paintings. Dreams would be fulfilled this day and greatness would be achieved as many would claim, now I have the greatest collection. The auction began with a painting that was not on any museum's list. It was the painting of the man's son. And the auctioneer asked for an opening bid and the room was silent. Who will open the bid with $100? Minutes passed and no one spoke. From the back of the room, someone yelled, Who cares about that painting? It's just a picture of a son. Let's forget about it and get on with the good stuff. And more voices echoed in agreement. No, we have to sell this one first. So the auctioneer asked again, Now, 
Who will take the picture of the son? And finally, a friend of the old man spoke up. Will you take $10 for the painting? That's all I have. I knew the boy and I knew his dad, so I'd like to have it. I have $10. Will anyone go higher? The auctioneer cried. And after more silence, the auctioneer said, going once, going twice, sold to the gentleman at the back for $10. The gavel fell and cheers filled the room and everyone was now excited and said, well, now let's get on to the real stuff. Let's get on to these treasures. And the auctioneer looked at the audience and announced that the auction was now over. Stunned disbelief quieted the room. Someone at the back spoke up and said, what do you mean it's over? We didn't come here for that picture. What about all these other paintings? There are millions of dollars of art here that will be wasted. I demand that you explain what's going on. And the auctioneer with meekness replied, it's very simple. There was a small stipulation in the will of the father. And according to his will, whoever takes the son gets it all. I've shared with you this morning five blessings of Christmas. A calm that can replace all of your anxiety and fear. A good news that will replace the bad news of your sin. Great joy that can come from despair. A salvation that will forgive and erase all of your sins. And a peace that replaces the conflict that you have in your heart. And the way that you receive those blessings is by taking the sun. And when you take the sun, you get it all. The message from the angels that first Christmas was fear not. For behold, I bring you good news of great joy. That's for everyone. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And that Savior that was born is how you can have those blessings of Christmas today. If you in your heart look by faith to Christ and you take the Son, when you take the Son, you get it all. And notice that message. It's not available just to a few. It's available to all the people to everyone who will come to Jesus by faith. Have you taken the sun today? Would you stand for just a moment? In just a moment, I'm going to pray and then we're going to receive communion together as a church. The Lord's Supper communion is a time for us to reflect upon as believers the sacrifice that Jesus made for us on the cross. The two elements, the bread, which symbolizes his broken body, and the cup that symbolizes his blood that was shed for us. And as believers, we take this, these elements in reflection and in remembrance and with great joy and thanksgiving for the fact that in Christ we have been offered all of these blessings. And because of Jesus Christ, we have them all. So I'm going to pray and then our worship team is going to lead us. Our elders will begin distributing the elements of the Lord's Supper. And we ask you in the first part of the song to just quietly reflect upon and worship through song on the sacrifice of Jesus for you. And then I'll come up and we'll take the elements of the Lord's Supper together. But will you pray with me? Father, our hearts are filled with joy today because of what we have in Christ. We give you thanks for the calm and the good news and the salvation that comes because of Jesus. And I pray that in this service today, you've been honored and glorified, and we lift our hearts with thanksgiving now as we reflect upon that Savior who gave his life for us. Christmas and the manger set your plan for salvation in motion when that Savior was born. But on the cross and through his victorious resurrection, our salvation was completed. And so we give you thanks for that today. And we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.